thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, this is an unusual talk for you, uh, 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 I imagine, because uh, 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 this I, I'm going to give you a narrative history. And this is uh, something that is uh, a little unusual for me, but probably even more unusual for you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, my co-author, Diana Magnuson, uh, who uh, uh, worked on me with this, uh, on, on, on this with me. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to give you the highlights of uh, the, the, some, a few political incidents and a broad sweep of institutional change in the Census Bureau, uh, and, and particularly in census data capture over, over the period from 1790 to 2020. If you're interested and you want more detail, uh, uh, Diana and I have a working paper on this uh, uh, topic uh, available on the Minnesota Population Center uh, website, and you can go there to get more. Um, so we're focusing in particular on data capture. And data capture we define as the methods and technologies used to transform raw census uh, responses into statistical tables. So, and, and by focusing on the, the federal responses is to the challenges of data capture over a very long run, we get to see how politics inter interacts with bureaucratic decision making. And uh, uh, it's pretty interesting. So uh, here's our thesis uh, that, that for a very long period, the US uh, census was the leading edge of data processing technology. Uh, the, the changes uh, in, in politics of course, influenced the content of the census and the uses to which it was put, but also influenced the methods that were used to capture the census in the first place. Uh, and, uh, uh, but unfortunately, since the 1990s, privatization of the data capture process uh, has led to a, a near disaster, as I will describe. So there's five major eras we, we define. Uh, in the history of census data capture, historians like to have periodization. So this is our periodization. And we will start with decentralized tabulation. So this guy is James Madison. You know him as the architect of the Constitution. He was also the architect of the US census. Uh, he proposed two census schedules, uh, a demographic schedule and an occupational schedule. The occupational schedule is going to specify the number of persons employed in different professions and arts, including merchants, mechanics, manufacturers. But it was defeated amidst concern that it would excite the jealousy of the people and was just gratifying an idle curiosity. M Madison wrote to Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, he, Jeff Jefferson was the guy responsible for the census uh, because that's what the Secretary of State did then. Uh, uh, he wrote, it was thrown out of the Senate as a waste of trouble and supplying materials for idle people to make a book. <laughs> so this is the form he came up with the 1790 census form. There was no printed form. Everybody, all the enumerators had to draw up their own form, but the layout was this pretty much uh, the same uh, everywhere. Uh, and, and there's just uh, five uh, questions. The first column, and so each, each line represents a household. Uh, the first column is the number of men age 16 and over. The second one is number of boys uh, under 16. The third one is number of, of white women. Those are both whites as well. And then all other free persons, that is non-white free persons, and then the number of slaves. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can see, uh, uh, it, this is a highly efficient design. Just to give you an example here, so we've got William Woody up there on the, uh, have I got a uh, button here? Uh, but anyway, William Woody's on the top line. He's, he's uh, 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 in a household with one adult male and one adult female. Then the second William Woody underneath him, one adult male, one adult female, and five young men under the age of 16. So uh, uh, he's probably his son. Uh, but what makes this so efficient is, see up here it says brought over. Well, this is from the previous page. Uh, these are the totals, and, and they added up the number of people in each of these categories, and then down at the top, the bottom, there's a new running total, and then that's brought forward to the next line. So what this meant was that uh, there was 
almost no need for any tabulation in Washington. They just were able to send the totals in. All of the work was done by the enumerators out in the field, uh, by the census marshals, uh, and uh, it was uh, very efficient. So the census grew rapidly from 1790 to 1840. It went from these five questions up to 80 columns. And this is the 1840 census form. Uh, and you can see it's, it's very detailed. The, the, uh, and, the, and the columns are quite cramped. They're 3 eighths of an inch by 3 eighths of an inch, uh, each little square. And, and it's, but it's just like the 1790 form. It's the number of people with various different characteristics. Uh, well, um, it was um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this led to uh, a lot of errors. The most famous of which uh, involved the, qu the questions on insanity and idiocy, uh, which led to the downfall of this form of the census. So over there on the far right of the form, there were two columns for insane or idiotic whites. Uh, and then two more columns for insane or idiotic, idiotic color, uh, colored people. They distinguish between insane at the public charge and not at the public charge. Uh, uh, and at any rate, uh, what was discovered uh, was that the farther you went north, the more insanity there was. Um, and, uh, you know, just one in 14 in Maine. By the time you get to Louisiana, it's one in 4,000. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, advocates of slavery uh, jumped on this uh, 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 and, uh, um, as evidence for the necessity of uh, slavery. So, so uh, uh, this is John C. Calhoun, in all instances in which the sta states have changed the former relation between the two races, the condition of the African, instead of being improved, has become worse. They have sunk into vice and pauperism, accompanied by bodily and mental inflictions incident thereto, including insanity and idiocy. Here is the proof of the necessity of slavery. The African is incapable of self-care and sinks into lunacy under the burden of freedom. Well, Edward Jarvis, he was a physician and statistician in Massachusetts. Uh, he wrote, uh, he looked into this a little more deeply and wrote a monograph called Insanity Among the Colored po Population. Here's a page from that. And, and you note in Maine there, uh, uh, up on the upper left, you get, these are all different towns in, in Maine, uh, and you can see that the number of colored insane consistently exceeds the number of colored inhabitants. <laughs> uh, and in many cases, in many towns have quite a few colored insane with no colored inhabi inhabitants whatsoever. Uh, and so uh, uh, Jarvis uh, realized what had happened. People make random uh, errors. Uh, over there on the right of the form and get things in the, in the colored column that occasionally in the white column doesn't make any difference. They do this in the north and they do it in the south, but in the south it doesn't make any difference because the denominator is so much bigger. In the north, there's no black population to speak of. They're very rare, and so just a few random errors of whites getting in the black column will uh, give you these, uh, this, this apparent uh, relationship. So uh, uh, Jarvis said... Uh, 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 it, it, this carries on its face its own refutation. It would have been far better to have had no census at all than such a one has been published, that it has been published. John Quincy Adams, who was then a <laughs> representative, uh, and he is the ex-president, he was in the House of Representatives. Calhoun writhed like a trodden rattlesnake on the exposure of his false report to the House that no material errors have been discovered in the census of 1840. This, this is what he wrote in his diary. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Okay, so this led to the end of the uh, uh, decentralized tabulation system, uh, uh, and Jarvis was uh, part of a uh, committee uh, that uh, uh, redesigned the census form, uh, and so, uh, but that created another big problem. So this is the census form they came up with. This is the free population form. There were six forms, but this was the main one. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we went from 40 columns down to 13 columns. But the big change is that instead of each row representing a household, now each row represents an individual. 
Uh, and because of this, you can have uh, responses that are not just numeric responses. So instead of having just like four or five occupational titles that were available in 1840, now we have every single individual's actual written out occupation. The first one up there is a malt manufacturer. Then, then he's got a cook living in his household. There's a couple of brewers uh, and so on. Uh, and then we've got the exact uh, uh, place of birth. We've got exact age instead of five-year groups. And so there's much, much more detail. We still have room for the uh, deaf, dumb, blind, insane, pauper, or uh, uh, convict over on the right-hand column. But we also have uh, uh, new, new questions like uh, uh, value of property, uh, 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 married within year, uh, school attendance, uh, and uh, um, um, literacy. So how do you tabulate this? You can't tabulate the, this in the field the way they did before because you've got to classify all of these different categories uh, and, and classify the, 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 the malt manufacturers into an occupational category. Uh, uh, and, and, and that requires expertise. Uh, and so they, they did it on, on what they called spreadsheets or condensing sheets. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, they did it with hash marks, basically. And so there were seven of these condensing sheets, each of which had about 10 tables on it. Uh, and uh, so every, every piece of paper, there were 700,000 paper forms uh, uh, with uh, 42 families, 42 people on each form. Uh, and the, each one of those 700,000 forms had to be tallied with hash marks in, uh, seven times uh, for the seven different condensing sheets. So. Uh, to do this work, the Census Bureau, uh, uh, the Census Office, it wasn't the Census Bureau yet, uh, 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 created a pop-up tabulating uh, operation of unprecedented scale. By the end of 1851, the Washington office had a total of 170 staff, which was 10% of the entire federal workforce in Washington, and nine times the number that had been required to tabulate the 1840 census. So the tabulation work wasn't completed for uh, the 1850 tabulation work until 1859. The Census Bureau tried looking for new technologies. In 1872, Charles W. Seaton, Seaton who was the chief uh, clerk of the census, uh, invented this device, the Seaton device. And it basically, you take a spreadsheet and you wrap it around all these rollers so that you can get your hash marks closer to one another. Uh, uh, and allowed you to tally eight categories at once. Um, uh, it wasn't really that good. Uh, he got a, a $15,000 bonus because his boss, Francis Walker, uh, 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 made a petition to Congress that he had saved 29 person years of a clerk's work, and that was the salary of 29 clerks. Uh, but uh, uh, a subsequent analysis has suggested that this was grossly exaggerated. It didn't work, uh, uh, and, uh, and as you can see, the number of peak census office staff doing tabulation continued to rise until by 1880 it was almost uh, 1,500. And yet, uh, the 1880 census uh, didn't get fully tabulated until 1888, uh, and uh, uh, Census Superintendent Will William Rush Merriam said, it's clear that a point must be reached before more decades had passed where complete tabulation before the next enumeration began would actually be impossible. So that brings us to our next historical era, the unit record machines from 1890 to 1950. So <clears throat> in order to deal with this problem, uh, um, uh, the, the, the census office decided to have a contest, uh, the 1889 uh, census contest. And uh, three uh, inventors submitted their, their, their solutions. They're all based on the same idea. The first was Charles F. Pigeon. He was chief, chief clerk of the Massachusetts Bureau of Labor Statistics. And he developed a system using cardboard chips printed in different colors. Census information was transcribed onto the chips uh, using symbols to represent different characteristics. And then the chips could be sorted into different piles. And you count the piles and make your tables that way uh, instead of using the hash marks. William C. Hunt had a simplified version of the pigeon system, where instead of using the colored chips, he used slips of paper. Uh, and instead of using uh, different colored uh, paper, he used colored inks. And so it was cheaper to implement, uh, but not as good. 
Uh, and then there was, of course, Herman Hollerith. Hollerith had worked for the census in 1880. He understood what the problems of tabulation were. And, and, but he had also, he was an engineer, and, and he uh, um, uh, uh, decided to make a machine for electric tabulation of cards with holes punched in the cards. So here's the results of the, of the uh, 1889 census contest. In the transcription phase, <clears throat> making the cards, or the slips, or the chips, uh, Hollerith had a little bit of an advantage, uh, uh, but it wasn't overwhelming. It was in the tabulation phase where uh, Hollerith was far, far better than the competition. And so overall, uh, he managed to tabulate the, the test case of 10,491 residents in St. Louis in less than half the time as the other two. So this made a big splash. He made the cover of Scientific American. Uh, and uh, uh, there were two key elements to it, the key, key punch machine uh, and then the, the uh, tabulating machine. Uh, and uh, I got these, uh, a series of photos from the, the Franklin Institute that I think have Hollerith in them. I think that's Hollerith but I'm not absolutely sure. But they kind of illustrate how this works. So there's this press. It's kind of like a waffle iron. Uh, and first you put the punch card in the press. Here's the, here's the key punch machine. There's the card. Uh, they actually called it a keyboard uh, for designating individual records. Uh, and then you close the, the, the box, uh, pulling the uh, pin box of spring-loaded pins. And so it, it's kind of like this waffle iron thing. And over on the right, you can see a cross-section of the pins. There's mercury cups. Uh, and wherever the, there's a spring-loaded pin hits a hole, it goes into the cup, makes a connection, and uh, that makes uh, an electromagnetic magnet uh, advance a dial counter. And in addition, open a door on the card sorter, uh, and the uh, operator inserts the card into, into the box. So that's the way it worked. Uh, uh, it was uh, highly successful in 1890. In 1900, uh, uh, well, 1896, Hollerith established a company, the Tabulating Machine Company. In 1900, uh, the census was processed with equipment that was rented from Hollerith. It was extremely expensive. Uh, it worked out to something like a half a million dollars rental, uh, which was a lot of money in those days. Um, <clears throat> so the Hollerith started uh, selling his machines to businesses. Uh, this is the Hollerith Type uh, 3 in 1921. Uh, and then uh, there's the Hollerith name. Uh, and then you can see there's a very similar machine, but now this is an IBM Type 285 in 1933. Uh, the Hollerith Company changed its name to IBM in 1923. Wow. Uh, and this is the, the, the Acme, uh, the pinnacle of unit record machines, was the Model 407, came out in 1949. Okay, so now I'm going to talk, talk about the census machine shop. In 1902, the Census Bureau was made a permanent agency. Prior to that time, it was a pop-up thing that happened every 10 years, except it was pretty much going continuously because it was taking them so long to do the tabulation. Uh, but they realized that they needed a permanent Census Bureau, that this was highly inefficient. So anyway, in 1905, uh, the, census, the first uh, Census Bureau director, uh, uh, North, uh, uh, obtained uh, $40,000 uh, from Congress to set up a machine shop uh, and uh, he hired a bunch of engineers from Hollerith uh, and uh, began production of its own tabulation equipment in direct competition with Hollerith. Now, you got to keep in mind, this is the progressive era, uh, 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 and Hollerith was seen as a trust. They had a monopoly. They had a monopoly over, over this thing, and they were charging exorbitant prices. The patents for Hollerith's original machinery were going to expire in 1906, and so uh, uh, the, the Census Bureau decided to go into direct competition with Hollerith uh, uh, and make their own equipment. Uh, and to do this, they hired, uh, in addition to uh, a bunch of engineers from the Hollerith company, they hired this guy, James Powers, uh, and he developed new punch card machines at the Census Bureau, uh, evading the Hollerith patents. Uh, he left, the, the, they did, and so they did the 1910 census, then he left in 1911 and uh, established the Powers Accounting Machine uh, Company. Uh, and Powers 
Uh, this is an ad on the left uh, for the Powers punch card system. It became the Remington Rand punch card system in 1950. So from 1910 to 1950, uh, the census was primarily done on machines that were actually built in the Census uh, Bureau, in the Census Machine Shop. It, it had different names. It eventually got called the Engineering Division. Uh, uh, here's a 1920 card sorter. Here's the Census Mechanical Laboratory. That's what they were calling it in the 1950s. Those guys are building uh, machinery for tabulation. This is a shot of tabulating the 1940 census entirely on machines built by the Census Bureau. And this is the last generation of Census Bureau mechanical tabulators in 1950. So uh, this is a Scientific American. Um, and um, so in, um, in, in 1946, uh, uh, IBM hired the Census Bureau chief of uh, uh, m uh, machine tabulation. Uh, and then they came out with a new machine uh, that uh, um, was based on Census Bureau designs, uh, and it was called a super duper census gadget <laughs> in the uh, in in in, science, in popular science. And 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 the iron here is uh, you know so the Census Bureau in 1906 you know essentially steals the intellectual property of Hollerith uh, uh, in order to uh, make their own machine so they don't have to rent stuff from Hollerith, and then in, in uh, 40 years later. Uh, IBM, the descendant of Hollerith, uh, goes and uh, 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 steals Census Bureau technology and actually manages to make machines. And they 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 rented 33 of these, 32 of these machines to IBM to tabulate the 1950 census. So uh, uh, what goes around comes around. But anyway, there is a third Census Bureau startup, uh, the Eckert Mousley Computer Corporation. Um, uh, uh, Eckert and Mousley had had made ENIAC uh, in the basement of the Moore School of Engineering at Penn. Uh, and uh, uh, it, was a, it was not a practical computer. Uh, but uh, they got a contract with the Census Bureau uh, to build a, a commercial computer that would actually be used for, for tabulating the census. Uh, and um, so they used this funding to start uh, make a company. They left Penn. Uh, and they started their own com spin-off company uh, using Census Bureau funds, uh, and they uh, built uh, and delivered in 1951 the world's first com uh, 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 commercial computer, uh, the Univac One. Uh, and uh, by that time, uh, the, you know, the Eckert Mousley had been bought by Remington Rand. Uh, and so this is all getting complicated. So in the beginning, there was the census. <laughs> The census begat the Hollerith Tabulating Machine Company, uh, which merged with uh, a couple of other companies to make the Computing Tabulating Recording Company, and that became renamed the International Business Machines Corporation. Then the census begat the Powers Accounting Machine Company, uh, which merged with two other companies to become Remington Rand. Uh, and then the census provided the funds for the Eckert Mosley startup, uh, which created Univac. Uh, which was bought by Remington Rand. So, that's uh, what happened. <laughs> uh, okay, but we're not done. Now we go on to Fosdick. Uh, so, uh, so by, uh, uh, by 1950, the tabulation problem was basically solved. Uh, the machinery was really fast, it was good, but it created a new bottleneck. And the new bottleneck was the punch card. Um, <clears throat> um, the population and housing components of the 1950 census required about 22 gigabytes of data storage. They were stored on 282 million 80 column cards weighing 600 tons that if piled up would make a stack 31 miles tall. They were drowning in punch cards. Uh, and managing these things, they're fragile, they're terrible, they're, they're just a terrible storage medium, uh, and that was all there was. So the 1960 census was the first 
computerized census. I know we had the 1951, the UNIVAC there, and one in 1951. They really didn't do anything with it. It wasn't, it wasn't practical, and it came along too late anyway. Uh, they, they had all those fast IBM tabulators. They did the work on those. Uh, and so uh, uh, they had this computerized thing, and that offered a potential solution uh, uh, to the punch card problem. So in 1952, uh, the Census Bureau machine shop began working on the film. Of, oh, no. Oh, this is an interesting thing. They just took that computer and they put it in exactly the same room. I showed you this pic picture before, table in the 1940 census. It's the same room. They just uh, took out the, all the unit record machines and threw in the big computer. But anyway, so uh, in 1952, the Census Bureau began working on this machine, the film optical sensing device for input to computers. This is the first high-speed optical mark recognition system. Uh, and the way it worked was this. You had bubble sheets. The enumerators would uh, transfer their information. They'd go around from house to house picking up the census forms. They would transfer them then to these bubble sheets. Here's a zoom in, uh, uh, clothes washing machine, ringer, springer, spinner, whatever. Uh, and, and so in some ways, this is like going back to 1790. We're decentralizing the data entry, right? Uh, but anyway, then you microfilm the bubble sheets and feed them through the uh, uh, Fosdick machine and uh, they, they go onto magnetic tape and you never have a punch card. And so it, it was an amazing machine. It was a marvel. Uh, and it was used for every census from 1960 to 1990. Uh, in 1970, there was an additional uh, 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 innovation that you could tell here, that you should see the little bubble being filled in there with the number two pencil. What happened in 1970 is they moved the, the data entry task to the public. Uh, the, the people were supposed to fill out their own bubble sheets. Uh, and then they, they received these forms by mail and they sent them back by mail. So, so uh, it was mail in, mail back, uh, and uh, 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 in 1960, it had been mailed out but picked up by the enumerator. So this is, uh, this is an envelope uh, for doing that. Uh, and uh, they had made a whole bunch of improvements to Fosdick. And they also invented these, this automatic uh, sheet turning machine. And I wish I had the movie. I have, I, I, I've seen a movie, and I want to get a hold of it, uh, that shows this. It's a real Rube Goldberg device. You see there's a little brush there, and it's like all this stuff going on. And, uh, uh, but anyway. And you can see that guy looks like he's from 1970. <laughs> um, 1980, more of the same, uh, uh, just uh, better uh, equipment. They, they, uh, and, and 1990, by 1990, the Fosdick machine was really half computer. Um, m many of the mechanical elements were gone. Uh, it was uh, uh, much more of an electronic rather than a mechanical device as it had been uh, early on. So, uh, but it was, and it was about uh, 80 times faster than the original 1960 uh, machine. It was super fast. Okay, so now we get to privatization. Um, so, <clears throat> for most of the 20th century, um, the federal government was expanding the scope of its activities. Uh, and, and after the war, it, you know, you had the New Deal and then interstate highway system. You had uh, uh, all these investments in health and education and uh, uh, the great society uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so this, this, this expansion of government came under attack, uh, especially beginning in the 1980s. Um, Reagan thought that the private sector was inherently more efficient than the public sector. Uh, and uh, he campaigned to privatize uh, government functions. Uh, uh, in his first inaugural address, Reagan said, uh, uh, government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. So the Reagan administration defined privatization as a strategy to shift the production of goods and services from the government to the private sector to reduce government expenditures, to take advantage of the marvelous efficiencies of, of, the, of, of, the, uh, of the marketplace. Uh, and um, there was, he, he didn't get that far. Uh, there was a Democratic majority in both houses at the time. Uh, and so he was, uh, uh, Reagan's privatization effort 
had a uh, limited uh, effect. Um, President Clinton had a far bigger impact. He campaigned in 1992 on, on a third way platform of shrinking the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and, and so with the support of Congress, uh, every department in the executive branch began uh, a, a rapid program of outsourcing. Hundreds of thousands of jobs formerly performed by federal employees began being performed by uh, Beltway contractors. Uh, so this is executive branch employment per million population from 1975 to 2014. And you can see, you know, uh, there was a little decline in the Clinton uh, administration in the early Reagan years, but then it kind of leveled off in the second half of the Reagan administration and the Bush administration. But then as soon as Clinton gets elected, it's a, it's, it's a massive decline, a 30% decline in uh, uh, federal employment. So since the census, uh, the Clinton era, era, there hasn't been too much change except for a little bump up during the Great Recession. As planning for the 2000 census ramped up in the early 1990s, there was a lot of pressure to identify what functions of the census could be outsourced. Uh, and uh, so uh, they, they basically outsourced uh, all of the data capture operations. Uh, in, in 1996, they closed the census machine shop that had been opened in 1906 uh, and uh, reassigned uh, the engineers mostly to work uh, on, on contracts. Um, so they didn't use FOSDIC. They used uh, the Data Capture System 2000, which was uh, built by Lockheed Martin uh, the, uh, there were uh, a, a dozen centers around the country which had these Kodak digital science document scanners in them, and they were managed by the other, another defense contractor, TRW. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the scanners were not only uh, uh, about 30 times slower than the FOSDIC machine, uh, but they also made a lot more errors. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, they, they didn't begin testing the imaging systems until 1998, and uh, it immediately became clear that it just wasn't working. The whole system didn't work. The software development was much slower than they anticipated. Uh, a lot of milestones were missed. Uh, in February 2000, just two months before data capture was going to begin, the General Accounting Office found that there were still 120 crucial de defects in the software and hardware, and even more troubling, the number of known critical problems actually had been going up over the previous six months. And so it was down to the wire. They did manage to get the system to work adequately at the last minute. Uh, the cost was vastly higher than anticipated, about a half a billion dollars for Lockheed Martin alone, uh, 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 which was five times of uh, what they had originally bid. So, but data capture went smoothly in Census 2000 compared with 2010. Now, to move back here, uh, sampling began uh, in the census in 1940. They started moving at first some of the questions to a sample line, and then they started, uh, in 1960, they asked 25% of the population to turn out, fill out a long form, and the proportion of the population filling out long form gradually declined. But the long form was eliminated entirely in 2010, uh, and, and those that, that part of the census was moved to the American Community Survey. And so in 2010, we only had a short form. There were only nine questions. Um, but there were major technology failures. Representative Waxman said, let me be blunt, this is a colossal failure. Census 2010 had the most expensive software development failure in history. GAO, GAO issued nine warnings in particular about the high risk posed by this device. This was a handheld personal digital assistant with GPS that we're supposed to use for non-response follow-up and for address verification. Uh, uh, um, and uh, it was supposed to uh, um, 
um, be done for six hundred million dollars. Um, but um, th this machine is actually it's still proudly displayed in a display case. Uh, and, and census headquarters where they've got all bits of the Hollerith machine and bits of the Fosdick machine and stuff like that. And they, they proudly display this as their latest technolog technological marvel, uh, even though it was uh, 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 such a disaster. So um, the, the Census Bureau didn't have adequate oversight of the contractor, according to the GAO. And, and in 2008, the program was just canceled. Uh, and, and this was a windfall for Lockheed, which got an extra two and a half billion dollars because the Census Bureau reverted to paper forms at the last minute, meaning that everything, you know, they thought that, that this would be direct to digital uh, uh, and, and they had to go back through the paper forms. And well, the other reason why, oh, oh yeah, in Brazil, they didn't have a trouble with this. They did it for $42 million. Uh, uh, and then they did the 2010 census, worked out just fine. Uh, um, now, um, the other big failure in 2010 was the internet response option. There was an internet response option in 2000. Only 42,000 people took advantage of it. It wasn't very well publicized, uh, but uh, it did work. Uh, they, and it was gonna be the major, the, the major thing for uh, 2010. Uh, this is the 2005 national census test. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the, it seemed like it was going well. But uh, then uh, the census uh, uh, director McKinnon thought, was worried about phishing. And so he canceled uh, the program in uh, 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 2005. And the reason why, but the biggest problem, reason was that the, 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 the contractor couldn't get the, uh, the website working in time and functional in time for the 2008 dress <coughs> rehearsal. Uh, and so they thought that it wouldn't be tested, and so they can't, they couldn't be confident of it, and so they just canceled it. So that all went to paper as well. But didn't they start the American Community Survey on, on the yeah. in between, around that time? Huh? Uh, I think it... I got it. I got both. I got the yeah. one in New Jersey and in New York. I got I'm not sure what year Internet. ACS went to being, uh, started the Internet Response so Option. They threatened to send me papers, so but I, I can, can I can... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, Canada, of course, they, they started uh, Internet Response Option in 2001. By 2011, they were old hands, many other countries. Uh, uh, in 2011, they had 54% uh, of uh, Canadian responses through the Internet, saving gobs of money. Okay. On the left is the uh, traditional cost metric uh, for... Uh, uh, the, the, the decennial censuses. Uh, so this is the cost per housing unit, basically, uh, uh, and uh, in, in 2010 dollars. Uh, and, and you can see, actually, the cost per housing unit actually went down uh, between 1940 and 1960. That's partly due, due to sampling. They, there's a little bit of sampling in 1940, but not much. Most people answered most questions. Uh, and, but it also, I think, reflects the uh, Fosdick machine. Uh, and efficiencies in data capture. Uh, and, then, and then costs started going up, and they started really accelerating in 1980. You could see, though, the huge jump in 2000 when it almost doubled, and another jump in 2010. Over on the right, I've done it uh, cost per item of information collected. So that's the population multiplied by the number of questions they asked uh, and, you know, depending on the sample density of the long form and whatnot, that, that, that varies over time. So th by this metric, you can see just what a disaster 2010 was. Uh, uh, because it was just a, it used to be that half the cost of collecting the census was the long form. They got rid of the long form, and the price still went up. Uh, and so if you, if you calculate in terms of uh, 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 cost per item of information gathered, uh, uh, it was it was a disaster. So 2020, well, there are challenges. Um, they are, again are doing internet response option and handheld uh, uh, devices for non-response follow-up. Uh, technology is not ready. This is just the most recent of uh, uh, dozens of GAO reports uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that have come out already. Uh, and they consider 
the 2020 census to be a very high risk. They say at this time, the Bureau has not achieved the level of institutional maturity needed to reliably bring these solutions to bear. The Bureau lacks well-established IT management and security controls. A high degree of risk and uncertainty exists. And there's uh, many, many headlines from the, uh, the Beltway Press about just what uh, a potential disaster is in the offing. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is without even considering the impact of the citizenship question. Uh, could this be another healthcare.gov? Okay. <clears throat> well, last week I had this guy uh, email me on Monday uh, who had read our working paper, uh, and he was a longtime uh, Census Bureau employee, and he said he's got the dirt. Um, uh, and uh, so um, uh, um, <clears throat> we, we then interviewed him last Friday, so just a couple of days ago, uh, and uh, uh, he described some pretty uh, uh, hostile, it was, it was a hostile time uh, when they closed down the machine shop and decided to privatize. This was, uh, 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 it, 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 sounds, it sounds terrible. The, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to try to follow up and see if we can get some more verification of, exact, of, of this from other sources uh, before we, we, we publish some of this stuff. But um, he, uh, he did speak of actual, uh, he says, near violent when we interviewed him. Well, I guess it sometimes was violent. So uh, um, at, at any rate, this is, a, this is an intriguing new thing. And now, though, uh, we have a whole bunch of, we have, you know, I usually don't do a peri period of history where you can, like, go talk to the people. <laughs> and I think that's so cool. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, we will be pursuing this. Uh, so anyway, here's my conclusions. From the late 19th century to the late 20th century, the US was the world leader uh, in the development of uh, large scale uh, data capture and information processing technology in general. Uh, and uh, these uh, uh, um, had numerous spin-offs. Uh, among other things, Digital street, street maps, they, uh, uh, which of course you know ended up transforming all our lives. Uh, they they were the ones who made the first uh, base maps and uh, uh, and created the technology to do that. Um, uh, and uh, so the Census Bureau lost this leadership position in the 1990s uh, when political pressure uh, led to privatization, uh, and it was not. I don't think it was ever even really intended as a cost-saving measure. They, they used that rhetoric at the time, but they, they must have known that uh, it was going to cost much, much more money. It was really ideologically driven, not, uh, not having to do with money. Uh, and uh, it created new risks that uh, threatened the censuses uh, at multiple times, and uh, it is entirely possible, I mean, that uh, Census 2020 could be a complete disaster. So, um, so uh, and now in the Census Bureau, there are hardly any computer programmers left. Uh, the, the technical, and there's no engineers, basically. Uh, the technical ex expertise is gone, uh, and, and they're dependent on military contractors for just about everything. So, that is the end. <laughs>